My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. Other people want to make friends, I'm just trying to make you some money. My job is not just to entertain you, but to educate and teach you. So call me at 1-800-743-CNBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. It's nail-biting time, even if you don't bite your nails. Right now, we're figuring out if the recent collapse in commodity prices is because the Fed's wrenched all of the speculative excess out of the system, good, or because the world's economy is slowing so rapidly that we're headed for a terrible recession, bad. And that's the number one question on Daily Today, where the Dow dipped 62 points, as it declined 0.30%, NASDAQ lost 0.72%. Now, I wish I could tell you the answer, but I don't think it's available yet. This morning, I had a discussion with Ken Langone, the brilliant businessman turned philanthropist. He was adamant that a bad recession would prove to be the culprit for commodities. And hey, he's got a point. The metals and plastics and wood complex are all down badly. Sure signs that industry is slowing worldwide. How inevitable is that recession in your view? Are we in a recession right now? Never say never. I think we are in a recession right now. I think intellectually and mentally we're in a recession right now. Wow. Yeah, it rang with me all day. That's all I thought about. Is it true? Well, I don't know. I puzzled over it for hours. I, why don't we approach this empirically before we conclude that we're un unavoidably headed for a deep recession? Remember, the ideal outcome here is to get enough of a slowdown that the Fed can take up rates gradually without throwing a ton of people out of work. Every day we get clues. We just need to know how to interpret them. Today we learned, for instance, that pending home sales edged up 0.7% in May versus April. Oh, boy, that's a too hot statistic. That means the Fed will have to tighten more aggressively. That is a Langone number. But then you look underneath the headline and you see the truth. The Northeast accelerated 15.4% month over month, smoking hot, bad. However, nationwide transactions dropped 13.6% year over year, with the largest decline in contract activity taking place in the West, where homes are way more expensive than the rest of the country. According to the National Association of Realtors, contract signings are down sizably from a year ago because of much higher mortgage rates. Now, this is where it gets really tricky. The chief economist for the National Association of Realtors, Lawrence Yoon, clearly seems alarmed by the signings number. He says, and I quote, trying to balance the housing market by choking off demand via higher mortgage rates is damaging to consumers and the economy. The better way to balance the market is through increased supply. Of course he's right. But the Fed can't build more houses. The home builders are trying the best they can to build as much as they can. See, I see comments like this, and it makes me think we could be looking at a rapid breakdown in sales. That's good news for the stock market, as long as it's not too rapid. My wife sells real estate for a living. She taught me that the prelude to a sudden plunge in housing prices is a dramatic drying up of contracts. That decline is what j Powell wants to see. He'll keep bringing that pain until it happens. He needs housing prices lower. They're up 20% over two years. When you put together the declining value of real estate, though, with the declining value of your 401k, well, you're going to have a weaker consumer, maybe a much weaker consumer, maybe two weak consumer. How about the enterprise? Today, we got durable goods orders, and they were up ever so slightly, 1.9 billion or 0.7% to 267.2 billion. In a vacuum, you might think that's excellent. But we're in a good news is bad news situation where strong numbers mean the Fed needs to tighten a lot more aggressively. How about commodities? All right, now, here we got to break them down one by one. Some great news here. Soy, sugar, corn, cattle, all down. Cotton's on pace for its worst month since 1995. Wheat's having its worst month since 2015. Copper worse since 2011. That's all fantastic from an inflation perspective. We'd be worried that Russia's invasion of Ukraine would cause worldwide food shortages, even famines. And it is in some places because so many calories have been taken offline. But now it's looking a little less likely. These commodity collapses are exactly what you want to see, and they're not from the Fed. However, crude oil, which had spent most of June going lower, finally snapped back today, up more than 2%. Natural gas jumped nearly 3%, so there goes the neighborhood. When energy's running like that, it's hard to believe we can have a soft landing, isn't it? Because high gas prices put a ton of pressure on the Fed to tighten. We go back and forth and back and forth. 
The drug stocks rally because of a belief that, that Powell will throw us into a recession. The tech stocks fall because we're beginning to get layoffs. UiPath, uh, one of the fastest growing tech darling automating repetitive motions, laid off 5% of its global workforce today. That would be inconceivable as recently as six months ago. Power boats, according to Baird, down 18% year over year in May. And then we got this cautionary article on CNBC.com about the coming Wall Street layoffs as the capital markets business is falling apart, something you can see from the total drop in IPOs. The math is ominous, the article says. Headcount of J.P. Morgan's investment bank, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, dropped by 13%, 70%, and 26%, respectively. You can only imagine how little some of these people have to do. Goldman Sachs has told me over and over again it can cut its table of employment swiftly and still make excellent money. I sense that maybe they have to do that. Another blow to the high-end real estate market. But then again... After the close tonight, Morgan Stanley just announced a $20 billion buyback and an 11% boost in the dividend. So how bad, thing, how bad can things be there? And Goldman just took its quarterly dividend up from $2 to $2.50 and changed. Maybe things are great. Oh, and then there was a savage report today by Goldman Sachs saying that Coinbase will have to lay off many more people than it already has. They cut the price target for the thing from 70 to 45 citing Coinbase's voracious cash burn. Uh, you can extrapolate from there to the whole crypto complex more than them later. So where do I come down on the recession that Ken Langone warned us about this morning? Let me put it this way. I am thinking what we really need, I think we need a knockout punch. I mean, just against inflation. A real roundhouse that takes us out of this on the one hand, on the other hand, landscape. It's ironic, but both Ken Langone and I said the Fed needs to hit us with a 100 basis point rate hike. For me, it's because that would take us where real estate losses, uh, loses value, homes become more affordable, labor market cools off enough to tamp down inflation. But Ken is talking about multiple 100 basis point hikes because he thinks we've got truly runaway inflation. As I see it, the stock market may be OK, given that there's a mix of good and bad data points. Given that stocks had such a big move last Friday, it felt like kind of like a consolidation day where we digest those gains. I, I didn't mind it. But make no mistake about it, we are not where we want to be. The fact that cranes can fall despite the Russo-Ukraine war is very strong. The fact that oil and gas are up is maddening. The bottom line, the news is precarious. It could go either way. But maybe that's what we need to see if we're going to have a soft landing, not a horrific crash landing. If all the data were strong, we'd be set up for a series of aggressive rate hikes that would wreck the economy. If all the data were weak, then it's already too late. This stuff is difficult to parse, isn't it? But it must be done, or else you're blind to what's happening out there. As I like to say at our 1020 morning meeting for Invested Club members, you need to calculate the mosaic if you're going to invest on a six- to nine-month basis, which is what I like to do for my travel trust. All I can say is for a rate hike cycle, it's so far so good. Nancy in Texas. Nancy. Yes. Hi, Jim. I want to thank you, first of all, for being such a great successor to Louis Rukeyser because he cared about the average investor like you do, and you're great as oh, well. You're very kind. Thank you. You're really kind to say that. I appreciate it. He was a great guy. Uh, my question is about Caterpillar. Okay. I have a great profit in it, but it has come off a tie, of course, and I'm wondering if I should pare back my position or just sit I tight. want you to buy more. I think Jim Mumbleby is the man. I think they're going to be – if you take a three- to five-year approach to this stock, Wow. Is it going to be great? Then that's the way you got to look at it. Don't forget 2.5% yield and a really smart CEO. Now I want to go to Todd in Texas, please. Todd. Jimmy Chill. The that Chill Man day? is here. <laughs> oh, man, you made my day. What's your, uh, what's your take on Global Foundries? Well, look, I mean, right now the Global Foundry business is good. It typically is not a good look business long term. I think it'll be fine. I would much prefer you to see, be in LAM Research, LRCX, which they have to buy in order to make a foundry work. And that stock is very, very cheap. Now we're going to John in Maryland. John. How are you and your staff doing today? My staff is unbelievable. They make me look good every single day, and they don't get enough appreciation. Thank you. Good. I'm glad you're doing good and your staff. I'm a um, longtime viewer and a thank member you. of your investment club. You guys do a great job. Oh, thank you. I'll tell Jeff Marks later tomorrow morning. Thank you. Okay, my question, Jim. I'm a longtime holder of Morgan Stanley. Um, I bought some early March, a little under 90. I've been following it all the way down. I'm thinking about buying some more here. Trades a little over 10 times earnings. Looks like it's positioned well. 
what are your thoughts? I couldn't agree more. They got, we got a big position, as you know, for the Chapel Trust. We keep buying it down like you. Why? Well, tonight they announced a gigantic dividend boost, 11%. More importantly, they have a $20 billion buyback now. So they're buying everything they can. That's why I like Morgan Stanley and James Gorman. They are doing terrifically. And it is such an inexpensive stock. It's kind of ridiculous. How can that thing be at nine times earnings? Wow, that's just wrong. All right, for a rate hike cycle, I don't know, so far so good. Oh, man, money tonight, Global Wafers, a silicon wafer company that supplies companies like Intel, now some multi-billion dollar factory today in Texas. I'm talking to Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo to get a read on what the government is doing to help ease the chip crunch. And believe me, she helped get that plan here. Then FedEx has surprised Wall Street after earnings. So what was the what was behind that strength? More importantly, could it continue? Breaking down the numbers. And is Belvin, the network solutions company, a classic example of a broken stock? I don't know, man. I think this is a stock that of a company that makes things, does stuff, gives you money, all the things we love. I'm finding out more about it with the CEO. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.